work. So um, as we said, I'm going to be talking about constructing the circular economy using stable bioprocesses from found microbial communities. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. Um, and uh, kind of this is a bit of an overview of the work that my lab, Dane's Lab for Applied Microbial Systems Ecology, will be uh, working on. So we're going to first look at why microbial communities for bioprocess and what I mean by that. Uh, so traditional bioprocesses are often kind of this one bug for the job. So a bacterium or a yeast, um, and it works great in the lab. This is often the approach for biopharmaceuticals, like penicillin, insulin, um, but also for algae biofuels, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a minute, um, or bioethanol. But um, it requires a really rigid environment and very sterile conditions that have to be maintained for this production. Um, and so maintaining these conditions, these ripe conditions uh, for this one bug to do its job um, and do it really effectively can be costly and resource intensive. And when we kind of also take this approach and look at um, processes for bioremediation, uh, there's a lot of people who can, you know, find an organism that you know, can degrade hydrocarbons, right? And they'll grow it in the lab. And they're like, look, we have, we have the answer to oil spills. They go put it in the environment, but that one bug does not work in complex natural environments. It doesn't have the tools. Using this one bug for bioremediation is not sustainable. The one bug is not native to that environment and does not have the right tools to live there. So maintaining the right condition is not possible. Within natural environments, microbes really exist everywhere. They're involved in many processes from soil formation, um, the colors in the um, Grand Prismatic Spring at Yellowstone are all the result of microbes and microbial processes. They can be involved in cloud formation, um, formation of huge cliffs. Uh, the White Cliffs of Dover are an example of that. They live in deep sea tube worms and actually support their life. Um, they're found in wetlands. Uh, we also use them in bioreactors. We use them in anaerobic digestion. Um, and we'll talk, I'll talk a little bit more about some of these as we move forward. And within these natural environments, microbes actually live in really complex communities. They're not like in the lab where you just have one bug. These, and they carry out dynamic interactions within their community and their environment to form kind of a circular bioeconomy amongst themselves where resources and wastes are recycled and repurposed to meet the nutritional constraints within that environment. So this is a lot like a network or a food web. And that's often what it's, what it's referred to as. I actually like to think of microbial communities a bit like an octopus. Um, octopus actually kind of have a brain in each one of their eight arms that receives information from their immediate environment but then the action of the octopus is the result of the integration of all of that information from each one of its arms. Similarly, within microbial communities, individual microbes consume resources and produce waste based on their immediate environment. But the integration of the activity of all of these individual microbes results in a process outcome for that community. So when we talk about process outcomes, these are things like maybe fixing carbon or the production of biogas from anaerobic digestion or production of hydrogen, methane, uh, the production of an electric current within a microbial fuel cell, um, value added products in various um, processes that we'll talk about as well. But they also you know, can do less favorable things like produce toxins or produce um, other harmful um, products as well. So really as a whole, these process outcomes are an emergent property of the activity of the community as a whole. So what I like to focus on is how can we mimic this circular bioeconomy of the microbial community in engineered processes to produce more robust process outcomes? Because they're a community and a network, it has an inherent robust Robustness. And we'll talk a little bit more about that, where um, the stability of the whole community is, again, a, an emergent property of that community. 
So understanding how the, the stability comes about is a big part of my research so that we can move toward engineered microbial communities as a reliable resource um, to build technologies and bioprocesses to be part of a larger circular economy. So this really exists at the interface of fundamental and applied sciences, where there's a really a lot of opportunity for innovation. So I'll show you one of those examples right now from a lab where I did my postdoc at the University of Calgary. Did I miss the slide? That one. Um, so I'll, um, this is microalgae for the production of blue pigment or phycocyanin. Um, traditional microalgae cultivation or cyanobacteria is um, another word for microalgae, which is single cell bacterial um, algae. Um, is used a lot in bioprocesses because it grows really fast and it uses carbon dioxide for a carbon source. So it's for its food it can take it just like a plant. It can take up carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And a lot of these um, cyanobacteria will also contain high amounts of lipids. So they're often used for um, production of biofuels. However, the CO2 usually needs to be added either by bubbling it through the medium or adding bicarbonate, and it needs to be in a controlled environment. Again, it this is the one bug for the job, but that culture, that bug is really vulnerable to crashes. So through nutrient loss, not having the right balance of the, the chemistry within the system, attack by viruses that will infect these cyanobacteria or protists that might eat them up, um, or various other microbes that can get in there. So you end up taking a lot more energy putting into these traditional molecular algae systems than you would to get out of it in biofuels. So the lab that I worked at at University of Calgary for my postdoc actually looked at cyanobacterial um, microbial communities. So cyanobacteria and a lot of other microbes and a couple different types of cyanobacteria um, up in some lakes in the Caribou Plateau. And these are soda lakes that are known to set with some of the highest carbon fixation rates of any environment that we know on the planet. And what they did is take samples and actually grow them in the lab. But instead of isolating like the one cyanobacteria that fixed carbon really good, it kept, the, kept several members of the community around. So it had bacteria and it had viruses and it had protists but it was stable and it actually survived in the lab for multiple, multiple years um, with high rates of carbon of uh, CO2 fixation. And it was very resilient to virus and protists. And we actually like took it outside, put it in this raceway pond and it was stable outside throughout multiple summers because it was so resilient. And the product that came out of that was phycocyanin, which is a pigment that's naturally produced by microalgae um, and founded the company Synergia Biotech. So this natural blue pigment is produced by the cyanobacteria um, and the community acts to stabilize this environment. And then that community also contributes to a, once we harvest, a solvent-free extraction process where nutrients are, and then, so the spike of cyanin is removed and then the biomass can be used in, as nutrients to feed back into the raceway ponds. Um, or potentially digested for methane production through anaerobic digestion. So all in all, this is a, actually a, a carbon neutral process. So when we try to approach using these found communities that exist in the environment and use them in engineered, push, engineered systems, these are some of like the stable design questions that I ask, like how do we design a stable community? So I look at what roles different members of that community play. What do these other microbes and bacteria and viruses do? A lot of times they'll occupy niches that would otherwise allow um, potential pathogens for those organisms or predators to get in. But because there's other organisms there and they're in a balance, they, those predators can't take hold. We also look at levels of microdiversity, which is like these tiny level, tiny differences in genetic code within a species. So kind of strain level um, that exists within mixed complex communities um, to provide resistance, like resilience to change or resistance to viral infection. 
And then we also look at the role of like the viruses within there that are infecting the microbes. Because while viruses might kill off some of the cyanobacteria, altering what that community looks like, they also release, so that a process also releases a lot of nutrients and may actually resupply things to the community when things are out of balance. So kind of in summary, some of the found microbial communities for bioprocess and bioremediation that are interesting to explore in various ways are kind of taking things from contaminated environments and then applying them and then finding you know, a, a stable community within your lab and then applying them to different environments for bioremediation processes or biodegradation. A lot of people also look at the microbes within the termite hindgut because termites eat wood, right? And then they break down the wood and lignin. Um, and often those, are, those can be used to make chemical pre precursors that can be used in other industries. And my work also explores using the microbes that are in wetland sediments as something to diversify anaerobic digestion feedstocks for methane production. So in all, these found communities can tolerate changes in natural environments to generate robust bioprocesses with application in waste valorization and bioremediation. Thank you all for listening.